hello and welcome to Freya's Tropical Garden. We haven't had the best weather over the last few weeks, but we're starting to have a few sunny days now, which the garden is absolutely loving. So fingers crossed it will continue. Now here's what we've got coming up for you in today's episode. There's part two of my series from the Lost Gardens of Heligan, and I bring you my guide to overwintering tropical plants. But coming up first, we've got my garden update, plus I'll take you around another section of my garden and talk about the plants that are growing there. It's been a wet and windy couple of weeks here on the south coast of the UK. We prepared for the arrival of Storm Kieran by taking down anything that was likely to blow away, and actually there wasn't very much damage except to the bananas, which of course naturally shred their leaves when there's wind. But other than that, the garden's still looking good at this time of year, and we've even had a few sunny days too. And I've got some new plants that have arrived, including Korea Marion's Marvel, which I've bought because it's an evergreen plant that flowers throughout winter with these beautiful, dainty yellow and pink flowers. It's known as the Australian fuchsia and is hardy down to about minus five degrees. I've also got Echium candicans, which is a variety of Echium that produces smaller and more numerous flower spikes. And Penicetum latifolia, which will be overwintered in my frost-free grow tent this year and then planted out next year where it will die back to ground level over winter. And finally, I ordered Nephophia northii, which is a giant red hot poker that will grow up to about 1.7 metres tall. Two weeks ago I showed you that one of the leaves on my ginkgo tree was turning yellow, now you can see most of them are. And my ginger, Zingiba myoga, is also turning yellow, as this will die back to ground level over winter. And my Gunnera tinctoria is also starting to look a bit tatty and I will be removing these leaves soon. The last of my Hedicium densiflorum flowers are fading, and even my Begonia Santa Cruz is now barely flowering at all. However, there is still some colour in the garden and the salvia amistad still looks absolutely lovely. And this is likely to keep flowering until the first frosts. And my salvia bethalii, which has only produced one flower so far, is now producing plenty of these pink buds. And a few of my cannas are still trying to throw up the odd flower. Although at the moment the only canna that actually has an open flower is the canna patterns. But I've got quite a bit of this throughout my garden and it really is just one or two flowers. And my arum lily has started to flower again. Although spring is the usual time of year for the arum lilies to flower, they will flower again in autumn if deadheaded. Hopefully I'll see a few more of these flowers before it gets cut down to ground level. And my dahlia bohemian spartacus has started to flower. This has a distinctive yellow stripe running through the petal. I even still have some Nicotiana flowering, and although most of them have gone to seed now, these ones were just a little bit later growing. A few weeks ago I also got this Abutalon, hot orange lava, which is still continuing to flower. Unfortunately the flowers normally hide under the leaves, so they're harder to see while the plant's still so small. At the moment it's just got a couple of buds. And the Fatsia japonica is another plant that flowers at this time of year. And this brings a nice bit of colour to an otherwise shady green area of the garden. My Strobilanthes diariana, or Persian shield, is also producing these tiny yellow flowers. And my Musabaz dew flowers are continuing to slowly strip away those outer petals as the flower itself gets smaller and smaller and hangs lower down the banana. So now we come to the part of the video where I take you round a section of my garden. And we're going to take a look at this bed here and go through all the plants that are growing here. Now at this time of year it is starting to look a bit tatty and a few of the plants are dying back. However, I have also got some videos from earlier in the year to show you for comparative purposes. So if you want to know more about a plant you've seen in this area, I'll go through them now. Camerops humilis is also known as the European fan palm. This is a clumping variety of palm, although I did remove the pups from around it when I planted it in order to create more space around it. This palm's hardy down to about minus nine degrees. These thin green tropical looking leaves are actually just sweet corn, which can be a great addition if you're looking to mix some edible planting in with your tropicals. 
They do need quite a bit of sun though, so this hasn't been the best location for them. But they have still produced some small ears of corn. Bershona rhea yacoides is actually a variety of succulent, so it needs to be planted where there's very good drainage. At the moment, I don't think mine has been enjoying all this rain that we've been having lately, so I'm actually going to dig this up and overwinter this indoors. Dahlia Mystic Enchantment and Dahlia Mystic Illusion are the two dahlias that I bought from RHS Wisley recently, and I absolutely love the beautiful dark foliage they have. Crocosmia Susanna is a hardy perennial with glorious golden yellow flowers. It ideally prefers a sunny spot with well-draining, moist soil. Brunera variegata grows best with full or partial shade. It will grow in a variety of soils, but particularly likes wet, boggy soils, and is hardy down to minus 15. Lilium regale is also known as the regal lily. It's native to China and grows well in a sheltered, sunny spot. It has the most beautiful white flowers in summer and is hardy throughout the UK. Lilium tiny invader is a dwarf Asiatic lily and provides a fantastic splash of colour. Washingtonia robusta is also known as the sky duster palm. They're only really hardy in the milder areas of the UK, however their fast growth rate makes them a very attractive option. I grew this from seed about five years ago. Canna musifolia is one of the tallest varieties of canna, growing up to about three metres tall. In the UK, it's grown mostly for its foliage, as our summers are not long enough for it to get to flowering. Starshine bronze papaya is a vibrant begonia, flowering from June till October. It's a mound-forming or trailing begonia, so it would also grow really well in a hanging basket. Strelitzia regini is also known as the bird of paradise due to the beautiful bird of paradise like flowers. Although my Strelitzia hasn't flowered yet and is probably unlikely to do so because in order to flower they do like to be root bound in a pot. They also like full sun and consistent moisture. However, they're not hardy in the UK so this will need to be dug up to be brought inside. And Sete ventricosa morellii is also known as the Abyssinian banana. Although not hardy in the UK, it's fast growing and grows best in a sunny sheltered spot. Musa basju, or the hardy banana, is the hardiest banana that you can grow in the UK. In milder areas of the UK, this will not need any protection at all over winter. However, in cooler areas, it can be protected or die back to ground level and reshoot in spring. Persicaria red dragon is a beautiful foliage plant with deep maroon leaves. It's fast growing and easy to propagate and dies back to ground level over winter. Persicaria purple fantasy is planted next to my red dragon for colour contrast. Although both varieties are predominantly grown for their foliage, they do produce masses of tiny white flowers which are great for attracting bees and other pollinators. Penacetum purpureum is also known as elephant grass. It's native to the African grasslands and has low water or nutrient requirements. However, this plant will need to be kept somewhere frost-free over the winter months. Ipomea batatus is actually the plant that sweet potatoes come from, although I am growing this for its lovely dark purple foliage, while pink funnel-shaped flowers are produced through summer. This plant is not hardy in the UK and will need to be dug up and brought in. Begonia silver spirit is a variety of begonia rex. The RHS gives a recommended hardiness rating that it can be grown outdoors in the summer months but should be grown indoors over winter. However, the one that I left out last year survived so I'll be trying again this year. Canna Robert Kemp is a beautiful variety of canna which I've got growing in two spots of my garden as I divided it when it arrived. Although this one hasn't flowered yet, my other one did flower earlier in the year. Ricinus communis, also known as the castor oil plant, is best grown as an annual in the UK. It can be grown from seed in spring and is so fast growing it can be eight foot tall by winter. Brachychiton rupestris is also known as the bottle tree due to the trunk which forms a wonderful bottle shape. However, it will take this one around five to ten years before that shape starts to emerge.
It's hardy down to about minus nine degrees. Nicotiana is a species of wild tobacco native to South America. I bought this from seed as Nicotiana glauca. However, I think it's probably been crossed with something else. But Nicotianas are so fast to grow from seed, they can be grown as annuals. Or if your plant hasn't really got going this year, you can bring it indoors and keep it till next year. I bought this variety from seed also, which was labelled as Nicotiana variegata. I haven't seen any variegation in the leaves yet, but again, I will probably overwinter this one indoors and give it another chance next year. This small banana is the Insette ventricosum I grew from seed earlier this year. Unlike the Morellii variant, this one doesn't have red leaves. However, the central stems should go red as it gets older. And finally, we have a variety of ginger called Zingiba myoga, also known as the Japanese ginger. This plant is edible, however, it's not the rhizome that we eat, but flower buds and new shoots. This plant is fast growing and spreads very quickly, so if you're looking for some ground cover, this is perfect. Now, coming up next, we've got part two of my trip to the Lost Gardens of Heligan. The Lost Gardens of Heligan are located near St Hostel in Cornwall, and its story is one of the most successful renovation projects in the world. The gardens were created from the mid-18th century, but abandoned at the onset of World War II. Over the decades that followed, the brambles and the ivy took over this once beautiful garden. And it wasn't until 1990 that the derelict gardens were rediscovered and the restoration project commenced. And over the next three decades, the garden was developed into the beautiful site that you can see today. And there is much to be discovered on your journey, including a giant head sculpted from a tree root and planted with Mind Your Own Business and Crocosmia. The Mud Maid, which was originally planned to be a mermaid, however the tail was scrapped when the nickname stuck and the Grey Lady sculpture, inspired by the mysterious grey figure once seen disappearing away from Heligan House. This was created from galvanised steel, and her appearance can change with different times of day or weather. However, the Jungle Garden was the main focus of my visit here. Even as recently as 2019, new jungle paths have been opened, and the Jungle Garden is constantly evolving and new plant species being added because they're not bound by the same restrictions as other parts of the garden, which remain true to historical accuracy. The historically Victorian plant hunters were always bringing back new species to plant in the garden, and this has given the jungle team the freedom to create this garden in their own image. So if you haven't visited for a few years, you're bound to see some new things, such as Calicia paradoxa. Native to South America, this spiny deciduous shrub known as the anchor plant has the most extraordinary spiny branches with fleshy flat triangular outward facing spines and in late summer through to autumn it has small creamy white tubular flowers which are sweetly fragranced. It prefers full sun or part shade and is hardy in most of the UK. Juncus acutus is also known as the spiny rush. It is a flowering plant found in a variety of wet habitats such as bogs, meadows, marshes or along the edges of ponds and lakes. It prefers moist acidic soil and full sun although it's drought tolerant once established. Elegia capensis is also known as the horsetail restio. It's a particularly elegant but invasive restio, bearing lush green bamboo-like stems and soft feathery leaves. It prefers moist but well-drained acidic to neutral soil, full sun or part shade, and is hardy in milder parts of the UK to about minus 5 degrees C. Aloeampelo striatula is an attractive aloe with tall spikes of yellow flowers tinged with red as they fade. It grows to about 2 foot tall and it prefers full sun and dry, well-drained soil, and is hardy to about minus 5 degrees. Puya chilensis is an exotic-looking bromeliad with arching grey-green leaves. It's native to Chile and grows up to 2 metres tall, preferring full sun and well-drained soil. It's frost-hardy and drought-tolerant. 
Agave salmiana is native to Mexico, however it's remarkably hardy in the UK if planted in full sun and free-draining soil. It's monocarpic, flowering after 15 to 25 years before dying. Agave americana variegata is also known as the century plant. It's an evergreen perennial growing up to 1.5 metres tall and it's hardy to at least minus 7 degrees C if kept dry throughout winter. Cycas revoluta is also known as the sago palm and is a spectacular slow-growing cycad from southern Japan. It's hardy down to about minus 5 degrees, however it may tolerate minus 7 if kept dry and daytime temperatures are above 0 degrees C. Echium pinanana is commonly known as the tree echium and is a species of flowering plant endemic to the Canary Islands. It grows to about 1.8 metres tall, preferring full sun and well-draining soil. It's a biennial, flowering in the second year before dying. Furcrea fetida is also known as the Mauritius hemp. It's an evergreen perennial succulent with spine-free, sword-like foliage. It's fast-growing and can be grown outdoors in the milder areas of the UK. It's monocarpic, producing a tall flower spike at the end of its life, which is a really spectacular architectural beauty. Hadicium flavicens is a perennial flowering plant from the ginger family, commonly known as the yellow ginger. It grows up to about 2.5 metres tall and is shade tolerant, although prefers full sun. It's hardy in milder areas of the UK. Hedicium gardnerianum is also known as the Kahili ginger and is one of the most reliable cultivars with dark green foliage and creamy white flowers, which unfortunately I missed on this visit. But the foliage is absolutely fantastic in the jungle garden. Canna tropicana is a beautiful plant with striking foliage and vibrant orange flowers. They need to be well watered and enjoy plenty of feed. Asa palmatum is more commonly known as the Japanese maple. It's a beautiful shrub or small tree and there are many different varieties with different leaf shapes and colours with some of the most attractive colouring appearing in spring or in autumn. Most aces prefer a sheltered shady spot away from winds and prefer neutral to acidic soil. I love how they've used this log to plant a variety of different bromeliads. They grow naturally in tropical rainforests on the bark of trees rather than in the ground. So will grow best with little or no soil but will need regular humidity and watering. Most bromeliads will not be hardy in the UK. However, fascicularia bicolor is hardy down to about minus 5 degrees. It's a rosette forming terrestrial bromeliad with slender, spiny-toothed, evergreen leaves that will grow best in well-draining, gritty soil if planted in the ground. When in active growth, it will need watering frequently. However, throughout the winter months, should be kept on the dry side. Ricinus communis is also known as the castor oil plant. It is grown by many tropical garden enthusiasts, including myself. Although it's not hardy, it's such a fast-growing plant, it can easily be grown as an annual, providing large jungle-like foliage and heights of up to 2 metres tall. Although when not grown as an annual, it can reach 8 to 12 metres tall in its natural habitat. Ruum palmatum is also known as the Chinese rhubarb. Although normally grown as an ornamental plant, the stems are edible like common rhubarb and is reported to have a superior flavour, although I've never tried it myself. Cordyline australis is also known as the cabbage tree. It's endemic to New Zealand and is thought to have got its nickname from the fact that early settlers used it as a substitute for cabbage. The green variety is hardy down to about minus 10 degrees whereas Cordyline Red Star will need winter protection if temperatures drop below minus 5 degrees. They prefer to grow in sun or part shade and can grow up to 3 metres tall. Persicaria red dragon leaves do start to turn green as the plant matures. However, you can see there is still a little bit of the red foliage left over here. 
this plant will die back to ground level over winter. Pleurandra elegantissima is a species of flowering plant native to New Caledonia. Its narrow, serrated leaflets give the tree a lacy feel. However, this plant is not hardy in the UK and will need winter protection. The Tasmania lanceolata is also known as the Tasmanian mountain pepper. It's a dense evergreen shrub growing up to four metres tall and the bark and the leaves give off a strong cinnamon scent. It grows best in acidic soil and partial shade and is hardy through most of the UK. Cornus kusa is a shrub or tree native to Japan and Korea. In summer it has beautiful white flowers, however in autumn it produces these amazing strawberry-like fruits. It is deciduous but it's hardy in the UK. Alea europea is also known as the olive tree. It's a small tree traditionally found in the Mediterranean basin. It prefers full sun and is hardy throughout most of the UK and is also drought tolerant. Blechnum cordatum or chilens is also known as the Chilean hard fern. This fern grows best in damp or wet soils and with at least some shade. Fronds can reach up to about one meter in length and it is hardy throughout the UK. Pontederia cordata is also known as pickerel weed. It's a marginal aquatic perennial with bright green lance-shaped leaves. It grows best in full sun and is hardy throughout most of the UK. I think you'll agree that the gardens of Heligan are absolutely beautiful. However, if you prefer to have more of an adventure in a garden, feeling that you are actually lost in a jungle, then the next video in two weeks time will be for you where I visit Penjerrick Gardens in Cornwall. Now, coming up next, I've got my guide to how I overwinter the plants in my garden. Overwintering is probably one of the most stressful and worrying times if you're new to tropical gardening. This year will be my fourth winter and I'm still learning things and tweaking my methods a bit. And sometimes a lot of it really does just come down to trial and error just to see what works for you. But this video will talk about seven different methods that I use to overwinter plants, as well as which plants I find work best with each method. But first, the question that most people will be asking is when do I start overwintering my plants? Leave it too late and those first frosts could cut them down. But go too early and you could be depriving your plants of plenty of time to enjoy the sunshine, rain, water. And particularly in the case of the ansette, if you are dry storing it, then go too early and it may not make it through a long winter. Of course, there's no precise time to start overwintering your plants as it can depend on the individual plant, your location and what the weather's doing. But generally here on the south coast of the UK, I would normally start overwintering my plants no earlier than mid-November. And last year I recorded my first frost damage on the 9th of December. But it's best to plan ahead by keeping an eye on the weather forecast. Frosts can occur when the temperatures start dropping to about 5 degrees or lower. So you can see here the weather forecast until the end of November still looks pretty good. Frosts will normally occur on a clear night when the air is dry. And this takes me on to my first technique, which is the plants that I leave in the ground to die back to ground level. Many of the plants that I grow in my tropical garden, including cannas, arum lilies, gingers, as well as bananas like Musa sicamensis, are root hardy and can die back to ground level and regrow again in spring. Of course, once again, this does depend on your precise location. And it may be in some cases you don't want to wait for the foliage to regrow and you'd rather overwinter it to keep it looking fresh and green first thing in spring. Or of course you may not want to lose the height in your plants. But from my perspective, overwintering plants can be quite time consuming. So if it can survive outside, I leave it. This also applies for any plants that I can back up with cuttings. My strobilanthes or Persian shield is reported to be root hardy, however mine hasn't survived the last couple of winters, so rather than dig up the whole plant, I just take a few cuttings. Other plants that I know I'm going to lose, like the irisine, I'll still leave in place because they're so easy to root from cuttings. And then the smaller pots take up a lot less space than large plants. 
If you want to know more about propagating cuttings, I did a video in episode 7 and I'll put a link to it in the description. Although my salvia amistad does normally come back each spring, I still back it up with cuttings. And last year I left this begonia rex out all winter, expecting it to die back, however it came back again in spring. So this year I'm going to be leaving a few more out, and I'll take leaf cuttings to back it up. Last year I just covered the plant with a couple of layers of fleece. This year I've also taken cuttings of my coleus for the first time. And it's worth pointing out that as well as taking cuttings, you can also back your plants up by collecting seeds. And I normally do this for plants grown as annuals like morning glories and ricinus. Next are the plants that I wrap up with horticultural fleece to protect them. My tetrapanics would normally go through a winter without needing any protection at all. However, last winter was particularly harsh and therefore I did wrap it up with some fleece to give it that added protection. I lost a few inches of height on it, but it survived the winter and came back beautifully this year. Now, if you've seen some of my earlier videos, you'll know that I overwintered my large insette for three years outdoors. Unfortunately, last winter was too cold or too wet for it. But I'm still going to talk you through this process because it may be that you've got an insette that you will have to grow as an annual because you've got no other space for it. Or in a colder climate, you may want to protect your musabaz juice this way. I also used this to overwinter an alocasia last year. And you start by removing all of the leaves so that you're left with the stump. Then using stakes or canes, you'll wrap the fleece around the three canes, leaving enough space that you can then pack that out with straw. You can see here I've covered the entire stump with straw. And some people like to put chicken wire around it just to hold it in place as well. Although the straw and the fleece do help insulate the plant, Please be aware it's not a substitute for a heated environment, but it will help the plant shield from the worst of the weather. Finally, you cover it with a plastic cloche or covering and then use the temp pegs to secure that in place. This is a particularly important step because you need to keep this fleece dry. And for this reason, as the insette stores a lot of water, I do change the straw once a month. Once again, I'm just going to reiterate, this is not the advisable method for overwintering an insette banana. However, in a warmer garden, if you've got no other choice, it may work. Next are the plants that I move into an unheated greenhouse. As before, this is not going to make that much difference to the temperature. Plants inside an unheated greenhouse will still suffer frost damage. However, I have a few plants in pots, such as the fascicularia, which will prefer to be kept on the dry side over winter, and the greenhouse is a perfect place to put them. I'll also put any dahlias that I've got growing in pots. So this method is ideal for any plants that are susceptible to rot if it's a really wet winter. So the next level of protection that I provide is for the plants that should be protected from frosts. Plants like my Liverstona rotundiflora can survive temperatures down to 0 degrees C, however will not survive frost. I will also be using this method for most of my ancetes, as these are still too small to dry store. These plants will be dug up and repotted in some fresh compost, and I've set up my grow tent in my garage. Once again, please be aware that if you're thinking of storing plants or dry storing plants in an unheated garage, they will still get frosted. So make sure that you've got a heater and a thermometer so that you can monitor the temperatures. I use one that records the minimum and maximum temperature. You'll also need a grow light. I use a 600 watt dimmable grow light, which I ordered off Amazon, and I've actually got two of these in this grow tent. And the foil inside the grow tent helps reflect the light. And finally, I keep a fan going in the grow tent to make sure that the air is circulating. Although it is still a bit early to be overwintering plants, I have moved a few plants into the grow tent so far to give you an idea. But for me personally, the most challenging thing about this setup is remembering to check on them regularly, so I find it helps to put a baby monitor camera in. A lot of the plants that I grow I move indoors over winter. Most plants brought indoors will prefer a nice bright spot out of direct sunlight, away from cold draughts and will require reduced levels of watering throughout winter. My Strelitzia nicolae is now getting so tall it's reaching to the top of the ceiling, so this may become a problem for me in future years. I would generally put most of my plants on west, north or east facing windowsills. However, there are plants that will do very well on a south facing windowsill, and sometimes it's just a case of getting to know your plants. 
However, in most cases, it's really important to avoid putting your plants anywhere near a radiator. And the reason that I set up a frost-free grow tent is because a lot of plants don't like being in centrally heated houses at all. Finally, this is my least favourite method of overwintering plants, which is dry storing. Only because I don't personally have a very high success rate with this method. However, if it works for you, then it is one of the easiest methods that you can use. It works with any plant that has a rhizome, such as caladiums, alocasias, colocasias, cannas, gingers. And you can even dry store larger insetes. Although I personally have never used this method, not only because I don't have much luck with dry storing, but also because the only insette that I had that was large enough to dry store, I was overwintering outdoors at the time. To dry store your rhizomes, you need to dig them up from the soil and try to clean off as much of the soil as you can. If you've got a lot of root, then you can trim them down. You're effectively storing these like spring bulbs. But the important points to remember are do not store them somewhere that is going to freeze if you're storing a variety that cannot survive being frozen. So an unheated garage or attic is probably going to be unsuitable. And the other thing to remember is that they need to be kept dry. So storing them in sawdust or paper or use silica gel bags to help absorb the moisture and try and keep them in a dry environment. Any damp that gets in will cause them to rot. And finally, for some plants like the insette, please be aware that they are in dormancy and they can only survive for so long, normally about four months. Of course, keeping track of what needs your plants have over winter can be a little bit daunting especially if you've got quite a lot of plants to remember. So I've recently downloaded a database app called Memento Database. And here I've created an index of all the plants that I grow in my garden. And I've added notes to myself to remind myself what each plant needs over winter. Although these notes are personal to me at the moment, so may not reflect needs in other parts of the country. But I can put in any search term, for instance, frost free, and I'll be provided with a helpful reminder list of all the plants that I need to keep in a frost-free environment over winter. The search will identify anything that you've typed into the record, so you can filter plants on other features as well, such as the humidity requirements that the plants need over winter. And although I am still developing this database at the moment, I do intend to make it available to share, which means if you've got the app, you can access my information which you can either use or just use it as a template to create your own. Well, that's all we've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and please feel free to leave your comments below. Now, here's what we've got coming up for you in a fortnight's time. I'll be taking you through the creation of my newest bed. I'll be planting some spring bulbs, including lasagna planting. And of course, I visit the Pengeric Gardens in Cornwall. If you're enjoying this content, then please do make sure you're subscribed to my channel. This is still a new channel, so every subscriber really does make a difference. You can also turn on notifications to make sure you don't miss any of my new videos. And please let me know what you think in the comments because they really do help my channel to grow. You can also follow me on social media for links to my latest videos and my photo of the day, in which I usually share photos of flowers from my garden, along with their names if known. You can follow me on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, threads, or you can join my Facebook group to ask questions or share photos. And you can find all of my YouTube videos on the Freya's Tropical Garden website, which I will also be expanding to provide advice pages as well as items for sale. Links to these pages are included in my description.